Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle was originally stated to explain the action of a liquid flowing through the varying cross-sectional areas of tubes. In figure 5-46 a tube is shown in which the cross-sectional area gradually decreases to a minimum diameter in its center section. A tube constructed in this manner is called a venturi, or venturi tube, where the cross-sectional area is decreasing. The passageway is referred to as a converging duct. As the passageway starts to spread out, it is referred to as a diverging duct. As the liquid, or a fluid, flows through the venturi tube, the gauges at points A, B, and C are positioned to register the velocity and the static pressure of the liquid. The venturi in figure 5-46 can be used to illustrate Bernoulli's principle, which states that the static pressure of a fluid, liquid or gas, decreases at points where the velocity of the fluid increases, provided no energy is added to, nor taken away from the figure 5-45. Piston movement in a hydraulic system. 5-30. Fluid. The velocity of the air is kinetic energy, and the static pressure of the air is potential energy. In the wide section of the venturi, points A and C of figure 5-46. The liquid moves at low velocity, producing a high static pressure, as indicated by the pressure gauge. As the tube narrows in the center, it must contain the same volume of fluid as the two end areas, as indicated by the velocity gauge reading high and the pressure gauge reading low. In this narrow section, the liquid moves at a higher velocity, producing a lower pressure than that of points A and C. A good application for the use of the Venturi principle is in a float-type carburetor. As the air flows through the carburetor on its way to the engine, it goes through a Venturi, where the static pressure is reduced. The fuel in the carburetor, which is under a higher pressure, flows into the lower pressure Venturi area and mixes with the air. Bernoulli's principle is extremely important in understanding how some of the systems used in aviation work, including how the wing of an airplane generates lift, or why the inlet duct of a turbine engine on a subsonic airplane is diverging in shape. The wing on a slow-moving airplane has a curved top surface, and a relatively flat bottom surface. The curved top surface acts like half of the converging shaped middle of a venturi. As the air flow over the top of the wing, the air speeds up, and its static pressure decreases. The static pressure on the bottom of the wing is now greater than the pressure on the top, and this pressure difference creates the lift on the wing. Bernoulli's principle and the concept of lift on a wing are covered in greater depth in Aircraft Theory of Flight, located in this chapter. Sound Sound has been defined as a series of disturbances in matter that the human ear can detect. This definition can also be applied to disturbances which are beyond the range of human hearing. There are three elements which are necessary for the transmission and reception of sound. These are the source, a medium for carrying the sound, and the detector. Anything which moves back and forth, or vibrates, and disturbs the medium around it may be considered a sound source. An example of the production and transmission of sound is the ring of a bell. When the bell is struck and begins to vibrate, the particles of the medium, or the surrounding air, in contact with the bell also vibrate. The vibrational disturbance is transmitted from one particle of the medium to the next, and the vibrations travel in a wave through the medium until they reach the ear. The eardrum, acting as protector, is set in motion by the vibrating particles of air, and the brain interprets the eardrum's vibrations as the characteristic sound associated with a bell. Wave motion. Since sound is a wave motion in matter, it can best be understood by first considering water waves, like a series of circular waves travel away from the disturbance of an object thrown into a pool. In figure 5-47 such waves are seen from a top perspective, with the waves traveling out from the center. In the cross-section perspective in figure 5-47, Notice that the water waves are a succession of crests and troughs. The wavelength is the distance from the crest of one wave to the crest of the next. Water waves are known as transverse waves, because the motion of the water molecules is up and down, or at right angles to the direction in which the waves are traveling. This can be seen. Pressure. Velocity Velocity Pressure. Low High Low High Low High Low High. A. B. C. Pressure waves traveling outward. Low High Low High. Crest Crest. Trough round object dropped into the water. Velocity. Pressure. Figure 5-47. Relationship between sound and waves in water. Figure 5-46. Bernoulli's principle and a Venturi. 5-31. By observing a cork on the water, bobbing up and down as the waves pass by, sound travels through matter in the form of longitudinal wave motions. These waves are called longitudinal waves, because the particles of the medium vibrate back and forth longitudinally in the direction of propagation. Figure 5-48 When the tine of a tuning fork moves in an outward direction, the air immediately in front of the tine is compressed so that its momentary pressure is raised above that at other points in the surrounding medium. 
because air is elastic. This disturbance is transmitted progressively in an outward direction from the tine in the form of a compression wave. When the tine returns and moves in an inward direction, the air in front of the tine is rarefied so that its momentary pressure is reduced below that at other points in the surrounding medium. This disturbance is transmitted in the form of a rarefaction, or expansion, wave and follows the compression wave through the medium. The progress of any wave involves two distinct motions. 1. The wave itself moves forward with constant speed. And 2. Simultaneously, the particles of the medium that convey the wave vibrate harmonically. Examples of harmonic motion are the motion of a clock pendulum, the balance wheel in a watch, and the piston in a reciprocating engine. Speed of sound. In any uniform medium, under given physical conditions, the sound travels at a definite speed. In some substances, the velocity of sound is higher than in others. Even in the same medium under different conditions of temperature, pressure, and so forth, the velocity of sound varies. Density and Tuning fork Compression Rarefaction Amplitude Wave Length Figure 5-48 Sound propagation by a tuning fork Elasticity of a medium are the two basic physical properties which govern the velocity of sound. In general, a difference in density between two substances is sufficient to indicate which one will be the faster transmission medium for sound. For example, sound travels faster through water than it does through air at the same temperature. However, there are some surprising exceptions to this rule of thumb. An outstanding example among these exceptions involves comparison of the speed of sound in lead and aluminum at the same temperature. Sound travels at 16,700 fps in aluminum at 20 degrees Celsius and only 4,030 fps in lead at 20 degrees Celsius, despite the fact that lead is much denser than aluminum. The reason for such exceptions is found in the fact, mentioned above, that sound velocity depends on elasticity as well as density. Using density as a rough indication of the speed of sound in a given substance, it can be stated as a general rule that sound travels fastest in solid materials, slower in liquids, and slowest in gases. The velocity of sound in air at 0 degrees Celsius 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 1087 FPS and increases by 2 FPS for each centigrade degree of temperature rise, or 1.1 FPS for each degree Fahrenheit. Mach number. In the study of aircraft that fly at supersonic speeds, it is customary to discuss aircraft speed in relation to the velocity of sound, which is approximately 760 miles per hour, miles per hour, at 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The term Mach number has been given to the ratio of the speed of an aircraft to the speed of sound, in honor of Ernst Mach, an Austrian scientist. If the speed of sound at sea level is 760 miles per hour, an aircraft flying at a Mach number of 1.2 at sea level would be traveling at a speed of 760 miles per hour times 1.2 equals 912 miles per hour. Frequency of sound. The term pitch is used to describe the frequency of a sound. The outstanding recognizable difference between the tones produced by two different keys on a piano is a difference in pitch. The pitch of a tone is proportional to the number of compressions and rarefactions received per second, which in turn, is determined by the vibration frequency of the sounding source. A good example of frequency is the noise generated by a turbofan engine on a commercial airliner. The high tip speeds of the fan in the front of the engine create a high frequency sound, and the hot exhaust creates a low frequency sound. Loudness. When a bell rings, the sound waves spread out in all directions and the sound is heard in all directions. When a bell is struck lightly, the vibrations are of small amplitude and the sound is weak. A stronger blow produces vibrations of greater. 5-32 Amplitude in the bell, and the sound is louder. It is evident that the amplitude of the air vibrations is greater, when the amplitude of the vibrations of the source is increased. Hence. The loudness of the sound depends on the amplitude of the vibrations of the sound waves. As the distance from the source increases, the energy in each wave spreads out, and the sound becomes weaker. As the sound wave advances, variations in pressure occur at all points in the transmitting medium. The greater the pressure variations, the more intense the sound wave is. The intensity is proportional to the square of the pressure variation regardless of the frequency. Thus, by measuring pressure changes, the intensities of sounds having different frequencies can be compared directly. Measurement of sound intensity. Sound intensity is measured in decibels, with a decibel being the ratio of one sound to another. One decibel decibel is the smallest change in sound intensity the human ear can detect. A faint whisper would have an intensity of 20 decibel, and a pneumatic drill would be 80 decibel. The engine on a modern jetliner, at takeoff thrust, would have a sound intensity of 90 decibel when heard by someone standing 150 foot away. 
exact 110 decibel noise. By comparison, would sound twice as loud as the jetliner's engine. Figure 5-49 shows the sound intensity from a variety of different sources. Threshold of audibility threshold of feeling. Lethal level. Turbo jet engine at 50 foot. 50 horsepower siren at 50 foot. Turbo jet engine at Takeo tilde at 150 foot 180. Automobile horn 160. 140 riveting machine. As heard by operator 130. An express train passing close by. 120. 110. 100 modern turbo engine at Takeo tilde at 150 foot. 90. Subway train at 20 foot 80. One half the loudness of 110 decibel noise. 70 pneumatic drill at 50 foot. 60 vacuum cleaner at 50 foot 50. 40 nearby freeway auto track. 30 private business oise. 20 residential area in the evening 10 soft whisper at 5 foot 0. Radio studio. Faint whisper. Figure 5-49. Sound intensity from different sources. Doppler effect. When sound is coming from a moving object, the object's forward motion adds to the frequency as sensed from the front, and takes away from the frequency as sensed from the rear. This change in frequency is known as the Doppler effect. And it explains why the sound from an airplane seems different as it approaches compared to how it sounds as it flies overhead. As it approaches, it becomes both louder and higher pitched. As it flies away, the loudness and pitch both decrease noticeably. If an airplane is flying at or higher than the speed of sound, the sound energy cannot travel out ahead of the airplane, because the airplane catches up to it the instant it tries to leave. The sound energy being created by the airplane piles up, and attaches itself to the structure of the airplane. As the airplane approaches, a person standing on the ground will not be able to hear it until it gets past their position, because the sound energy is actually trailing behind the airplane. When the sound of the airplane is heard, it will be in the form of what is called a sonic boom. Resonance all types of matter, regardless of whether it is a solid, liquid, or gas, have a natural frequency at which the atoms within that matter vibrate. If two pieces of matter have the same natural frequency, and one of them starts to vibrate, it can transfer its wave energy to the other one and cause it to vibrate. This transfer of energy is known as resonance. Some piston-engine-powered airplanes have an RPM range that they are placarded to avoid, because spinning the prop at that RPM can cause vibration problems. The difficulty lies in the natural frequency of the metal in the prop, and the frequency of vibration that will be set up with a particular tip speed for the prop. At that particular RPM, stresses can be set up that could lead to the propeller coming apart. The atmosphere. Aviation is so dependent upon that category of fluids called gases and the effect of forces and pressures acting upon gases that a discussion of the subject of the atmosphere is important to the persons maintaining and repairing aircraft. Data available about the atmosphere may determine whether a flight will succeed, or whether it will even become airborne. The various components of the air around the Earth, the changes in temperatures and pressures at different levels above the Earth, the properties of weather encountered by aircraft in flight, and many other detailed data are considered in the preparation of flight plans. Paskin and Toroselli have been credited with developing the barometer, an instrument for measuring atmospheric pressure. The results of their experiments are still used today with very little improvement in design or knowledge. The 5-33 determined that air has weight which changes as altitude is changed with respect to sea level. Today scientists are also interested in how the atmosphere affects the performance of the aircraft and its equipment. Composition of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a complex and ever-changing mixture. Its ingredients vary from place to place and from day to day. In addition to a number of gases, it contains quantities of foreign matter such as pollen, dust, bacteria, soot, volcanic ash, spores, and dust from outer space. The composition of the air remains almost constant from sea level up to its highest level, but its density diminishes rapidly with altitude. Six miles up, for example, it is too thin to support respiration. And 12 miles up, there is not enough oxygen to support combustion, except in some specially designed turbine engine-powered airplanes. At a point several hundred miles above the Earth, some gas particles spray out into space. Some are dragged by gravity and fall back into the ocean of air below while others never return. Physicists disagree as to the boundaries of the outer fringes of the atmosphere. Some think it begins 240 miles above the Earth, and extends to 400 miles. Others place its lower edge at 600 miles, and its upper boundary at 6,000 miles. There are also certain non-conformities at various levels. Between 12 and 30 miles, high solar ultraviolet radiation reacts with oxygen molecules to produce a thin curtain of ozone, a very poisonous gas without which life on Earth could not exist. This ozone filters out a portion of the sun's lethal ultraviolet rays. 
allowing only enough coming through to give us sunburn, kill bacteria, and prevent rickets. At 50 to 65 miles up, most of the oxygen molecules begin to break down under solar radiation into free atoms, and to form hydrazyl ions, O, from water vapor. Also in this region, all the atoms become ionized. Studies of the atmosphere have revealed that the temperature does not decrease uniformly with increasing altitude. Instead it gets steadily colder up to a height of about 7 miles, where the rate of temperature change slows down abruptly and remains almost constant at minus 55 degrees centigrade, 218 degrees Kelvin, up to about 20 miles. Then the temperature begins to rise to a peak value of 77 degrees centigrade, 350 degrees Kelvin, at the 55 mile level. Thereafter it climbs steadily, reaching 2270 degrees centigrade, 2543 degrees Kelvin, at a height of 250 to 400 miles. From the 50 mile level upward, a man or any other living creature, without the protective cover of the atmosphere, would be broiled on the side facing the sun, and frozen on the other. The atmosphere is divided into concentric layers or levels. Transition through these layers is gradual, and without sharply defined boundaries. However, one boundary, the tropopause, exists between the first and second layer. The tropopause is defined as the point in the atmosphere at which the decrease in temperature, with increasing altitude, abruptly ceases. The four atmosphere layers are the troposphere, stratosphere, ionosphere, and the exosphere. The upper portion of the stratosphere is often called the chemosphere or ozonosphere, and the exosphere is also known as the mesosphere. The troposphere extends from the Earth's surface to about 35,000 foot at middle latitudes, but varies from 28,000 foot at the poles to about 54,000 foot at the equator. The troposphere is characterized by large changes in temperature and humidity, and by generally turbulent conditions. Nearly all cloud formations are within the troposphere. Approximately three-fourths of the total weight of the atmosphere is within the troposphere. The stratosphere extends from the upper limits of the troposphere, and the tropopause to an average altitude of 60 miles. The ionosphere ranges from the 50-mile level to a level of 300 to 600 miles. Little is known about the characteristics of the ionosphere, but it is thought that many electrical phenomena occur there. Basically, this layer is characterized by the presence of ions and free electrons, and the ionization seems to increase with altitude, and in successive layers. The exosphere, or mesosphere, is the outer layer of the atmosphere. It begins at an altitude of 600 miles, and extends to the limits of the atmosphere. In this layer, the temperature, is fairly constant at 2500 degrees Kelvin, and propagation of sound is thought to be impossible due to lack of molecular substance. Atmospheric pressure. The human body is under pressure, since it exists at the bottom of a sea of air. This pressure is due to the weight of the atmosphere. On a standard day at sea level, if a 1 in 2 column of air extending to the top of the atmosphere was weighed, it would weigh 14.7 pounds. That is why standard day atmospheric pressure is said to be 14.7 pounds per square inch, 14.7 psi. Since atmospheric pressure at any altitude is due to the weight of air above it, pressure decreases with increased altitude. Obviously, the total weight of air above an area at 15,000 foot would be less than the total weight of the air above an area at 10,000 foot. Atmospheric pressure is often measured by a mercury barometer. A glass tube somewhat over 30 inches in length is sealed at one end and then filled with mercury. It is then inverted and the open end placed in a dish of mercury. Immediately, the mercury level in the inverted tube will drop a short distance, leaving a small volume of mercury vapor at nearly zero absolute pressure in the tube just above the top of the liquid mercury column. Gravity acting on the mercury in 5-34. The tube will try to make the mercury run out. Atmospheric pressure pushing down on the mercury in the open container tries to make the mercury stay in the tube. At some point these two forces, gravity and atmospheric pressure, will equilibrate out and the mercury will stabilize at a certain height in the tube. Under standard day atmospheric conditions, the air in a 1 square inch column extending to the top of the atmosphere would weigh 14.7 pounds. A 1 in 2 column of mercury, 29.92 inches tall, would also weigh 14.7 pounds. That is why 14.7 psi is equal to 29.92 hg. Figure 5-50 demonstrates this point. A second means of measuring atmospheric pressure is with an aneroid barometer. This mechanical instrument is a much better choice than a mercury barometer for use on airplanes. Aneroid barometers, or altimeters, are used to indicate altitude in flight. The calibrations are made in thousands of feet rather than in psi or inches of mercury. For example, the standard pressure at sea level is 29.92 hg, or 14.7 psi. At 10,000 feet above sea level, standard pressure is 20.58 
HG, or 10.10 Psi. Altimeters are calibrated so that if the pressure exerted by the atmosphere is 10.10 Psi, the altimeter will point to 10,000 foot. Figure 5-51, Atmospheric Density. Since both temperature and pressure decrease with altitude, it might appear that the density of the atmosphere would remain fairly constant with increased altitude. This is not true, however, because pressure drops more rapidly with increased altitude than does the temperature. The result is that density decreases with increased altitude. I-0-0 feet I-9-2-0-8-3-1-1 Alt 29.8-29.9-7-30.0-6-4-5 Figure 5-51 an airplane's altimeter is an aneroid barometer. Vacuum. 14.7 psi atmospheric pressure. 760 mm 29.92 in. Figure 5-50. Atmospheric pressure as inches of mercury. By use of the general gas law, studied earlier, it can be shown that for a particular gas, pressure and temperature determine the density. Since standard pressure and temperatures have been associated with each altitude, the density of the air at these standard temperatures and pressures must also be considered standard. Thus, a particular atmospheric density is associated with each altitude. This gives rise to the expression, density altitude, symbolized, HD. A density altitude of 15,000 foot is the altitude at which the density is the same as that considered standard for 15,000 foot. Remember, however, that density altitude is not necessarily true altitude. For example, on a day when the atmospheric pressure is higher than standard and the temperature is lower than standard, the density which is standard at 10,000 foot might occur at 12,000 foot. In this case, at an actual altitude of 12,000 foot, we have air that has the same density as standard air at 10,000 foot. Density altitude is a calculated altitude obtained by correcting pressure altitude for temperature. Water content of the atmosphere. In the troposphere, the air is rarely completely dry. It contains water vapor in one of two forms. One fog or 2. Water vapor. Fog consists of many droplets of water held in suspension by the air. Clouds are composed of fog. The height to which some clouds extend is a good indication of the presence of water in the atmosphere almost up to the stratosphere. The presence of water vapor in the air is quite evident in figure 5-52, with a military F-18 doing a high-speed flyby at nearly Mach 1. The temperature and pressure changes that occur as the airplane approaches supersonic flight cause the water vapor in the air to condense and form the vapor cloud that is visible. 5-35 Figure 5-52 F-18 high-speed flyby and a vapor cloud As a result of evaporation, the atmosphere always contains some moisture in the form of water vapor. The moisture in the air is called the humidity of the air. Moisture does not consist of tiny particles of liquid held in suspension in the air as in the case of fog, but is an invisible vapor truly as gaseous as the air with which it mixes. Fog and humidity both affect the performance of an aircraft. In flight, at cruising power, the effects are small and receive no consideration. During takeoff, however, humidity has important effects. Two things are done to compensate for the effects of humidity on takeoff performance. Since humid air is less dense than dry air, the allowable takeoff gross weight of an aircraft is generally reduced for operation in areas that are consistently humid. Second, because the power output of reciprocating engines is decreased by humidity, the manifold pressure may need to be increased above that recommended for takeoff in dry air in order to obtain the same power output. Engine power output is calculated on dry air. Since water vapor is incombustible, its pressure in the atmosphere is a total loss as far as contributing to power output. The mixture of water vapor and air is drawn through the carburetor, and fuel is metered into it as though it were all air. This mixture of water vapor, air, and fuel enters the combustion chamber where it is ignited. Since the water vapor will not burn, the effective fuel-slash-air ratio is enriched and the engine operates as though it were on an excessively rich mixture. The resulting horsepower loss under humid conditions can therefore be attributed to the loss in volumetric efficiency due to displaced air, and the incomplete combustion due to an excessively rich fuel and air mixture. The reduction in power that can be expected from humidity is usually given in charts in the flight manual. There are several types of charts in use. Some merely show the expected reduction in power due to humidity. Others show the boost in manifold pressure necessary to restore full takeoff power. The effect of fog on the performance of an engine is very noticeable particularly on engines with high compression ratios. Normally, some detonation will occur during acceleration, due to the high VMEP, which stands for brake mean effective pressures, developed. However, on a foggy day it is difficult to cause detonation to occur. The explanation of this lies in the fact that fog consists of particles of water that have not vaporized. 
when these particles enter the cylinders. They absorb a tremendous amount of heat energy in the process of vaporizing. The temperature is thus lowered, and the decrease is sufficient to prevent detonation. Fog will generally cause a decrease in horsepower output. However, with a supercharged engine, it will be possible to use higher manifold pressures without danger of detonation. Absolute Humidity Absolute humidity is the actual amount of the water vapor in a mixture of air and water. It is expressed either in grams per cubic meter or pounds per cubic foot. The amount of water vapor that can be present in the air is dependent upon the temperature and pressure. The higher the temperatures, the more water vapor the air is capable of holding, assuming constant pressure. When air has all the water vapor it can hold at the prevailing temperature and pressure. It is said to be saturated. Relative humidity. Relative humidity is the ratio of the amount of water vapor actually present in the atmosphere to the amount that would be present, if the air were saturated at the prevailing temperature and pressure. This ratio is usually multiplied by 100 and expressed as a percentage. Suppose, for example, that a weather report includes the information that the temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity is 56%. This indicates that the air holds 56% of the water vapor required to such a rate it at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperature drops and the absolute humidity remain constant, the relative humidity will increase. This is because less water vapor is required to such a rate the air at the lower temperature. Dew point. The dew point is the temperature to which humid air must be cooled at constant pressure to become saturated. If the temperature drops below the dew point, condensation occurs. 5-36 People who wear eyeglasses have experience going from cold outside air into a warm room, and having moisture call it quickly on their glasses. This happens because the glasses were below the dew point temperature of the air in the room. The air immediately in contact with the glasses was cooled below its dew point temperature, and some of the water vapor was condensed out. This principle is applied in determining the dew point. A vessel is cooled until water vapor begins to condense on its surface. The temperature at which this occurs is the dew point. Vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the portion of atmospheric pressure that is exerted by the moisture in the air, which is expressed in tenths of an inch of mercury. The dew point for a given condition depends on the amount of water pressure present. Thus, a direct relationship exists between the vapor pressure and the dew point. Standard atmosphere. If the performance of an aircraft is computed, either through flight tests or wind tunnel tests, some standard reference condition must be determined first in order to compare results with those of similar tests. The conditions in the atmosphere vary continuously and it is generally not possible to obtain exactly the same set of conditions on two different days, or even on two successive flights. For this reason, a set group of standards must be used as a point of reference. The set of standard conditions presently used in the United States is known as the U.S. Standard Atmosphere. The standard atmosphere approximates the average conditions existing at 40 degrees latitude, and is determined on the basis of the following assumptions. The standard sea level conditions are pressure at zero altitude, P0 equals 29.92 Hg. Temperature at zero altitude, T0 equals 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Gravity at zero altitude, G0 equals 32.174 FPS slash S. The U.S. Standard Atmosphere is in agreement with the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, standard atmosphere over their common altitude range. The ICAO standard atmosphere has been adopted as standard by most of the principal nations of the world. Aircraft Theory of Flight Before a technician can consider performing maintenance on an aircraft, it is necessary to understand the pieces that make up the aircraft. Names like fuselage, empennage, wing, and so many others, come into play when describing what an airplane is and how it operates. For helicopters, names like main rotor, anti-torque rotor, and autorotation come to mind as a small portion of what needs to be understood about rotorcraft. The study of physics which includes basic aerodynamics, is a necessary part of understanding why aircraft operate the way they do. Four forces of flight. During flight, there are four forces acting on an airplane. These forces are lift, weight, thrust, and drag. Figure 5-53, lift is the upward force created by the wing. Weight is the pull of gravity on the mass. Thrust is the force created by the airplane's propeller or turbine engine. And drag is the friction caused by the air flowing around the airplane. All four of these forces are measured in pounds. Any time the forces are not in balance, something about the airplane's condition is changing. The possibilities are as follows. 1. When an airplane is accelerating, it has more thrust than drag. 2. When an airplane is decelerating, it has less thrust than drag. 3. When an airplane is at a constant velocity, thrust and drag are equal. 4. 
when an airplane is climbing, it has more lift than weight. 5. When an airplane is descending, it has more weight than lift. 6. When an airplane is at a constant altitude, lift and weight are equal. Bernoulli's principle and subsonic flow. The basic concept of subsonic airflow and the resulting pressure differentials was discovered by Daniel Bernoulli, a Swiss physicist. Bernoulli's principle, as we refer to it today, states that as the velocity of a fluid increases, the static pressure of that fluid will decrease, provided there is lift, drag thrust, weight. Figure 5-53. Four forces acting on an airplane. 5-37. No energy added or energy taken away. A direct application of Bernoulli's principle is the study of air as it flows through either a converging or a diverging passage, and to relate the findings to some aviation concepts. A converging shape is one whose cross-sectional area gets progressively smaller from entry to exit. A diverging shape is just the opposite, with the cross-sectional area getting larger from entry to exit. Figure 5-54 shows a converging shape duct, with the air entering on the left at subsonic velocity and exiting on the right. Notice that the air exits at an increased velocity and a decreased static pressure when looking at the pressure and velocity gauges and the indicated velocity and pressure. The unit leaving must increase its velocity as it flows into a smaller space because a unit of air must exit the duct when another unit enters in a divergent duct. Just the opposite would happen. From the entry point to the exit point, the duct is spreading out and the area is getting larger. Figure 5-55, with the increase in cross-sectional area, the velocity of the air decreases and the static pressure increases. The total energy in the air is not changed. What has been lost in velocity, which is kinetic energy, is gained in static pressure, which is potential energy. In the discussion of Bernoulli's principle earlier in this chapter, Venturi was shown in Figure 5-46. In Figure 5-56, Venturi is shown again, only this time a wing is shown tucked up into the recess, where the Venturi's converging shape is. There are two arrows showing airflow. The large arrow shows Velocity Pressure 300 miles per hour 14 psi Low high low high Subsonic Air tilde out 400 miles per hour 10 psi Low high low high Velocity Pressure Velocity Pressure 300 miles per hour 14 psi Low high low high Subsonic Air tilde out 400 miles per hour 10 psi Low high low high Velocity. Pressure. Figure 5-54. Bernoulli's principle and a converging duct. Figure 5-55. Bernoulli's principle and a diverging duct. Airflow within the Venturi. And the small arrow shows airflow on the outside heading toward the leading edge of the wing. In the converging part of the Venturi, velocity would increase and static pressure would decrease. The same thing would happen to the air flowing around the wing, with the velocity over the top increasing and static pressure decreasing. In figure 5-56, the air reaching the leading edge of the wing separates into two separate flows. Some of the air goes over the top of the wing and some travels along the bottom. The air going over the top, because of the curvature, has farther to travel. With a greater distance to travel, the air going over the top must move at a greater velocity. The higher velocity on the top causes the static pressure on the top to be less than it is on the bottom. And this difference in static pressures is what creates lift. For the wing shown in figure 5-56, Imagine it is 5 foot wide and 15 foot long for a surface area of 75 foot to 10,802. If the difference in static pressure between the top and bottom is 0.1 psi, there will be 1 tenth ounce of lift for each square inch of surface area. Since there are 10,802 of surface area, there would be 1,080 pounds of lift, 0.1 times 10,800. Lift and Newton's third law. Newton's third law identifies that for every force there is an equal and opposite reacting force. In addition to Bernoulli's principle, Newton's third law can also be used to explain the lift being created by a wing. As the air travels around the wing and leaves the trailing edge, the air is forced to move in a downward. 5-38 Cord line leading edge Air tilt out velocity increase Airplane path relative wind Upper camber Angle of attack Lower camber trailing edge Figure 5-56 Venturi with a superimposed wing Figure 5-57 Wing terminology Direction Since a force is required to make something change direction, there must be an equal and opposite reacting force. In this case, the reacting force is what we call lift. In order to calculate lift based on Newton's third law, Newton's second law and the formula, force equals mass times acceleration, would be used. The mass would be the weight of air flowing over the wing every second. 
and the acceleration would be the change in velocity the wing imparts to the air. The lift on the wing as described by Bernoulli's principle, and lift on the wing as described by Newton's third law, is not separate or independent of each other. They are just two different ways to describe the same thing. Namely the lift on the wing. Airfoils. An airfoil is any device that creates a force, based on Bernoulli's principles or Newton's laws, when air is caused to flow over the surface of the device. An airfoil can be the wing of an airplane, the blade of a propeller, the rotor blade of a helicopter, or the fan blade of a turbofan engine. The wing of an airplane moves through the air, because the airplane is in motion, and generates lift by the process previously described. By comparison, a propeller blade, helicopter rotor blade, or turbofan engine fan blade rotates through the air. These rotating blades could be referred to as rotating wings, as is common with helicopters when they are called rotary wing aircraft. The rotating wing can be viewed as a device that creates lift, or just as correctly, it can be viewed as a device that creates thrust. In figure 5-57 an airfoil, or wing, is shown, with some of the terminology that is used to describe a wing. The terms and their meaning are as follows. Camber. The camber of a wing is the curvature which is present on top and bottom surfaces. The camber on the top is much more pronounced, unless the wing is a symmetrical airfoil, which has the same camber top and bottom. The bottom of the wing, more often than not, is relatively flat. The increased camber on top is what causes the velocity of the air to increase and the static pressure to decrease. The bottom of the wing has less velocity and more static pressure, which is why the wing generates lift. Cord line. The cord line is an imaginary straight line running from the wing's leading edge to its trailing edge. The angle between the cord line and the longitudinal axis of the airplane is known as the angle of incidence. Relative wind. The relative wind is a relationship between the direction of airflow and the aircraft wing. In normal flight circumstances, the relative wind is the opposite direction of the aircraft flight path. If the flight path is forward then the relative wind is backward. If the flight path is forward and upward, then the relative wind is backward and downward. If the flight path is forward and downward, then the relative wind is backward and upward. Therefore, the relative wind is parallel to the flight path, and travels in the opposite direction. Angle of attack. The angle between the cord line and the relative wind is the angle of attack. As the angle of attack increases, the lift on the wing increases. If the angle of attack becomes too great, the airflow can separate from the wing and the lift will be destroyed. When this occurs, a condition known as a stall takes place. There are a number of different shapes, known as planned forms that a wing can have. A wing in the shape of a rectangle is very common on small general aviation airplanes. An elliptical shape or tapered wing can also be used, but these do not have as desirable a stall characteristic for airplanes that operate at 5-39 High subsonic speeds Swept back wings are common and for supersonic flight, a delta shape might be used. The aspect ratio of a wing is the relationship between its span or a wingtip to wingtip measurement and the cord of the wing. If a wing has a long span and a very narrow cord, it is said to have a high aspect ratio. A higher aspect ratio produces less drag for a given flight speed and is typically found on glider type aircraft. The angle of incidence of a wing is the angle formed by the intersection of the wing cord line and the horizontal plane passing through the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. Many airplanes are designed with a greater angle of incidence at the root of the wing than at the tip, and this is referred to as washout. This feature causes the inboard part of the wing to stall before the outboard part, which helps maintain aileron control during the initial stages of a wing stall. Boundary Layer Airflow The boundary layer is a very thin layer of air lying over the surface of the wing and, for that matter, all other surfaces of the airplane. Because air has viscosity, this layer of air tends to adhere to the wing. As the wing moves forward through the air the boundary layer at first flows smoothly over the streamlined shape of the airfoil. Here the flow is called the laminar layer. As the boundary layer approaches the center of the wing, it begins to lose speed due to skin friction and it becomes thicker and turbulent. Here it is called the turbulent layer. The point at which the boundary layer changes from laminar to turbulent is called the transition point. Where the boundary layer becomes turbulent, drag due to skin friction is relatively high. As speed increases, the transition point tends to move forward. As the angle of attack increases, the transition point also tends to move forward. With higher angles of attack and further thickening of the boundary layer, the turbulence becomes so great the air breaks away from the surface of the wing. At this point, the lift of the wing is destroyed and a condition known as a stall has occurred. In figure 5-58, view A shows a normal angle of attack and the airflow staying in. View of UB, figure 5-58, wing boundary layer separation, contact with the wing. View B shows an extreme angle of attack. 
and the airflow separating and becoming turbulent on the top of the wing. In view B, the wing is in a stall. Boundary layer control. One way of keeping the boundary layer air under control, or lessening its negative effect, is to make the wing surface as smooth as possible, and to keep it free of dirt and debris. As the friction between the air and the surface of the wing increases, the boundary layer thickens, and becomes more turbulent, and eventually a wing stall occurs. With a smooth and clean wing surface, the onset of a stall is delayed and the wing can operate at a higher angle of attack. One of the reasons ice forming on a wing can be such a serious problem is because of its effect on boundary layer air. On a high-speed airplane, even a few bugs splattered on the wing's leading edge can negatively affect boundary layer air. Other methods of controlling boundary layer air include wing leading edge slots, air suction through small holes on the wing's upper surface, and the use of devices called vortex generators. A wing leading edge slot is a duct that allows air to flow from the bottom of the wing, through the duct, to the top of the wing. As the air flows to the top of the wing, it is directed along the wing's surface at a high velocity, and helps keep the boundary layer from becoming turbulent and separating from the wing's surface. Another way of controlling boundary layer air is to create suction on the top of the wing through a large number of small holes. The suction on the top of the wing draws away the slow-moving turbulent air, and helps keep the remainder of the airflow in contact with the wing. Vortex generators are used on airplanes that fly at high subsonic speed, where the velocity of the air on the top of the wing can reach Mach 1. As the air reaches Mach 1 velocity, a shock wave forms on the top of the wing, and the subsequent shock wave causes the air to separate from the wing's upper surface. Vortex generators are short airfoils, arranged in pairs, located on the wing's upper surface. They are positioned such that they pull high-energy air down into the boundary layer region, and prevent airflow separation. Wing Tip Vortices Wing tip vortices are caused by the air beneath the wing, which is at the higher pressure, flowing over the wing tip, and up toward the top of the wing. The end result is a spiral or vortex that trails behind the wingtip any time lift is being produced. This vortex is also referred to as wave turbulence, and is a significant factor in determining how closely one airplane can follow behind another on approach. 5-40 Figure 5-59 Wing and horizontal stabilizer vortices on an MD-11 To land The wake turbulence of a large airplane can cause a smaller airplane, if it is following too closely, to be thrown out of control. Vortices from the wing, and from the horizontal stabilizer are quite visible on the MD-11 shown in figure 5-59. Upwash and downwash refer to the effect an airfoil has on the free airstream. Upwash is the deflection of the oncoming airstream, causing it to flow up and over the wing. Downwash is the downward deflection of the airstream after it has passed over the wing, and is leaving the trailing edge. This downward deflection is what creates the action and reaction described under Lift and Newton's third law. Axes of an aircraft. An airplane in flight is controlled around one or more of three axes of rotation. These axes of rotation are the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical. On the airplane, all three axes intersect at the center of gravity. As the airplane pivots on one of these axes, it is in essence pivoting around the center of gravity, CG. The center of gravity is also referred to as the center of rotation. On the brightly colored airplane shown in figure 5-60, the three axes are shown in the colors red, vertical axis, blue, longitudinal axis, and orange, lateral axis. The flight control that makes the airplane move around the axis is shown in a matching color. The rudder, in red, causes the airplane to move around the vertical axis and this movement is described as being a yaw. The elevator, in orange, causes the airplane to move around the lateral axis and this movement is described as being a pitch. The ailerons, in blue, cause the airplane to move around the longitudinal axis and this movement is described as being a roll. Aircraft stability. When an airplane is in straight and level flight at a constant velocity, all the forces acting on the airplane are in equilibrium. If that straight and level flight is disrupted by a disturbance in the air, such as wake turbulence, the airplane might pitch up or down, yaw left or right, or go into a roll. If the airplane has what is characterized as stability, once the disturbance goes away, the airplane will return to a state of equilibrium. Static stability. The initial response that an airplane displays after its equilibrium is disrupted is referred to as its static stability. If the static stability is positive, the airplane will tend to return to its original position after the disruptive force is removed. If the static stability is negative, the airplane will continue to lateral axis, longitudinal axis, CG, vertical axis, figure 5-60. The three axes intersect at the airplane's center of gravity. The flight control that produces motion around the indicated axis is a matching color. 5-41 move away from its original position after the disruptive force is removed. If an airplane with negative static stability has the nose pitch up because of wake turbulence, the tendency will be for the nose, 
to continue to pitch up even after the turbulence goes away. If an airplane tends to remain in a displaced position after the force is removed, but does not continue to move toward even greater displacement, its static stability is described as being neutral. Dynamic stability. The dynamic stability of an airplane involves the amount of time it takes for it to react to its static stability after it has been displaced from a condition of equilibrium. Dynamic stability involves the oscillations that typically occur as the airplane tries to return to its original position or attitude. Even though an airplane may have positive static stability, it may have dynamic stability which is positive, neutral, or negative. Imagine that an airplane in straight and level flight is disturbed and pitches nose up. If the airplane has positive static stability, the nose will pitch back down after the disturbance is removed. If it immediately returns to straight and level flight, it is also said to have positive dynamic stability. The airplane, however, may pass through level flight and remain pitched down, and then continue the recovery process by pitching back up. This pitching up and then down is known as an oscillation. If the oscillations lessen over time, the airplane is still classified as having positive dynamic stability. If the oscillations increase over time, the airplane is classified as having negative dynamic stability. If the oscillations remain the same over time, the airplane is classified as having neutral dynamic stability. Figure 5-61 shows the concept of dynamic stability. In view, the displacement from equilibrium goes through three oscillations, and then returns to equilibrium. In view B, the displacement from equilibrium is increasing after two oscillations, and will not return to equilibrium. In view C, the displacement from equilibrium is staying the same with each oscillation. Longitudinal stability. Longitudinal stability for an airplane involves the tendency for the nose to pitch up or pitch down, rotating around the lateral axis, which is measured from wingtip to wingtip. If an airplane is longitudinally stable, it will return to a properly trimmed angle of attack after the force that upset its flight path is removed. The weight and balance of an airplane, which is based on both the design characteristics of the airplane and the way it is loaded, is a major factor in determining longitudinal stability. There is a point on the wing of an airplane, called the center of pressure or center of lift, where all the lifting forces concentrate. In flight, the airplane acts like it is being lifted from or supported by this point. This center of lift runs from wingtip to wingtip. There is also a point on the airplane, called the center of gravity, where the mass or weight of the airplane is concentrated. For an airplane to have good longitudinal stability, the center of gravity is typically located forward of the center of lift. This gives the airplane a nose-down pitching tendency which is balanced out by the force generated at the horizontal stabilizer and elevator. The center of gravity has limits within which it must fall. If it is too far forward, the forces at the tail might not be able to compensate and it may not be possible to keep the nose of the airplane from pitching down. In figure 5-62, the center of lift, center of gravity, and center of gravity limits are shown. It can be seen that the center of gravity is not only forward of the center of lift, it is also forward of the center of gravity limit. At the back of the airplane, the elevator trailing edge is deflected upward to create a downward force on the tail, to try and keep the nose of the airplane up. This airplane would be highly unstable longitudinally, especially at low speed, when trying to land. It is especially dangerous if the center of gravity is behind the aft limit. The airplane will now have a tendency to pitch nose up, which can lead to the wing stalling and possible loss of control of the airplane. Forward CG limit aft CG limit. OBC. Positive static and positive dynamic stability. Positive static and negative dynamic stability. Positive static and neutral dynamic stability. Time. Time time. Center of lift. Center of gravity. Figure 5-62. Longitudinal stability and balance. Figure 5-61. Dynamic stability. 5-42. Lateral stability. Lateral stability of an airplane takes place around the longitudinal axis, which is from the airplane's nose to its tail. If one wing is lower than the other, Good lateral stability will tend to bring the wings back to a level flight attitude. One design characteristic that tends to give an airplane good lateral stability is called dihedral. Dihedral is an upward wing angle, with respect to the horizontal, and it is usually just a few degrees. Imagine a low-wing airplane with a few degrees of dihedral experiencing a disruption of its flight path such that the left wing drops. When the left wing drops, this will cause the airplane to experience a side slip toward the low wing. The side slip causes the low wing to experience a higher angle of attack which increases its lift, and raises it back to a level flight attitude. The dihedral on a wing is shown in figure 5-63. Directional stability. Movement of the airplane around its vertical axis, and the airplane's ability to not be adversely affected by a force creating a yaw type of motion, is called directional stability. The vertical fin gives the airplane this stability, causing the airplane to align with the relative wind. In flight, 
The airplane acts like the weather vane we use around our home to show the direction the wind is blowing. The distance from the pivot point on a weather vane to its tail is greater than the distance from its pivot point to the nose. So, when the wind blows, it creates a greater torque force on the tail and forces it to align with the wind. On an airplane, the same is true. With the CG being the pivot point, it is a greater distance from the CG to the vertical stabilizer than it is from the CG to the nose. Figure 5-64 Dutch Roll The dehedral of the wing tries to roll the airplane in the opposite direction of how it is slipping and the vertical fin will try to yaw the airplane in the direction of the slip. These two events combine in a way that affects lateral and directional stability. If the wing dehedral has the greatest effect, the airplane will have a tendency to experience a Dutch roll. A Dutch roll is a small amount of oscillation around both the longitudinal and vertical axes. Although this condition is not considered dangerous, pivot point, CG, distance to vertical stabilizer creates stability. Figure 5-64 directional stability caused by distance to vertical stabilizer. It can produce an uncomfortable feeling for passengers. Commercial airliners typically have yaw dampers that sense a Dutch roll condition and cancel it out. Flight control surfaces. The purpose of flight controls is to allow the pilot to maneuver the airplane, and to control it from the time it starts the takeoff roll until it lands, and safely comes to a halt. Flight controls are typically associated with the wing, and the vertical and horizontal stabilizers because these are the parts of the airplane that flight controls most often attach to. In flight, and to some extent on the ground, flight controls provide the airplane with the ability to move around one or more of the three axes. Flight controls function by changing the shape or aerodynamic characteristics of the surface they are attached to. Flight controls and the lateral axis. The lateral axis of an airplane is a line that runs below the wing, from wingtip to wingtip, passing through the airplane's center of gravity. Movement around this axis is called pitch, and control around this axis is called longitudinal control. The flight control that handles this job is the elevator attached to the horizontal stabilizer. A fully moving horizontal stabilizer, or on a V-tail configured airplane, it is called rudder rudders. An elevator on a Cessna 182 can be seen in figure 5-65. In figure 5-66, a fully moving horizontal stabilizer, known as a scabilator, can be heatle. Figure 5-63 The dehedral of a wing Elevator Figure 5-65 Elevator on a Cessna 182 provides pitch control 5-43 Moving horizontal stabilizer, stabilator Rudder pedals Control wheel or yoke Figure 5-66 Moving horizontal stabilizer, known as a stabilator On a Piper Cherokee Cruiser Pennsylvania 28-140 provides pitch control be seen on a Piper Cherokee Cruiser Pennsylvania 28-140, and Figure 5-67 shows a rudder rudder on a Beechcraft Bonanza. Depending on the airplane being discussed, movement around the lateral axis happens as a result of the pilot moving the control wheel or yoke, the control stick, or on some airplanes, a side stick. On the airplanes shown in Figures 5-70 and 5-71, a control wheel or yoke is used. On the Cessna 182 shown in Figure 5-65, Pulling back on the control wheel causes the trailing edge of the elevator to deflect upward, causing an increased downward force that raises the nose of the airplane. Movement of the elevator causes the nose of the airplane to pitch up or pitch down by rotating around the lateral axis. The Cessna 182 control wheel can be seen in Figure 5-68. On the Piper Cherokee Cruiser Pennsylvania 28-140 shown in Figure 5-66. Pulling back on the control wheel causes the entire horizontal surface, or stabilator, to move with the trailing edge deflecting upward. The anti-servo tab seen on the Cherokee provides a control feel similar to what would. Rudder Vitters Figure 5-67 Rudder Vitters on a Beechcraft Bonanza provide pitch control. Figure 5-68 Cessna 182 control wheel and rudder pedals. Be experienced by moving an elevator. Without this tab, a later might be too easy to move and a pilot could over-control the airplane. The rudder vitters shown on the Beechcraft Bonanza in Figure 5-67 are also moved by the control wheel, with their trailing edges deflecting upward when the control wheel is pulled back. As the name implies, these surfaces also act as the rider for this airplane. Flight controls and the longitudinal axis. The longitudinal axis of the airplane runs through the middle of the airplane, from nose to tail, passing through the center of gravity. Movement around this axis is known as roll, and control around this axis is called lateral control. Movement around this axis is controlled by the ailerons, and on jet transport airplanes, it is aided by surfaces on the wing known as spoilers. 
The ailerons move as a result of the pilot rotating the control wheel to the left or to the right, much the same as turning the steering wheel on an automobile. Figure 5-68 When a pilot turns the control wheel to the left, the airplane is being asked to turn or back to the left. Turning the control wheel to the left causes the trailing edge of the aileron on the left wing to rise up into the airstream, and the aileron on the right wing lowers down into the airstream. This increases the lift on the right wing, and decreases the lift on the left wing, causing the right wing to move up and the airplane to back to the left. In figure 5-69, an aircraft can be seen doing an aileron roll. Notice that the left aileron is up and the right aileron is down, which would cause the airplane to roll around the longitudinal axis in a counterclockwise direction. Flight controls and the vertical axis. The vertical axis of an airplane runs from top to bottom through the middle of the airplane, passing through the center. 5-44 Aileron up. Rudder. Aileron down. Anti-servo tab. Figure 5-70. Rudder and anti-servo tab on a Piper Cherokee arrow. Figure 5-69. Aircraft performing an aileron roll. Of gravity. Movement around this axis is known as yaw and control around this axis is called directional control. Movement around this axis is controlled by the rudder. Or in the case of the Beechcraft Bonanza in figure 5-67, by the rudder rudders. The feet of the pilot are on the rudder pedals, and pushing on the left or right rudder pedal makes the rudder move left or right. The trailing edge of the rudder moves to the right, and the nose of the airplane yaws to the right, when the right rudder pedal is pushed. The rudder pedals of a Cessna 182 can be seen in figure 5-68. Even though the rudder of the airplane will make the nose yaw to the left or the right, the rudder is not what turns the airplane. For what is called a coordinated turn to occur, both the ailerons and rudder come into play. Let's say we want to turn the airplane to the right. We start by turning the control wheel to the right, which raises the right aileron and lowers the left aileron and initiates the banking turn. The increased lift on the left wing also increases the induced drag on the left wing, which tries to make the nose of the airplane yaw to the left. To counteract this, when the control wheel is moved to the right, a small amount of right rudder is used to keep the nose of the airplane from yawing to the left. Once the nose of the airplane is pointing in the right direction, pressure on the rudder is no longer needed. The rudder of a Piper Cherokee Arrow can be seen in Figure 5-70. Tabs. Trim Tabs. Trim tabs are small movable surfaces that attach to the trailing edge of flight controls. These tabs can be controlled from the flight deck, and their purpose is to create an aerodynamic force that keeps the flight control in a deflected position. Trim tabs can be installed on any of the primary flight controls. A very common flight control to find fitted with a trim tab is the elevator. In order to be stable in flight, most airplanes have the center of gravity located forward of the center of lift on the wing. This causes a nose-heavy condition, which needs to be balanced out by having the elevator deflect upwards and create a downward force. To relieve the pilot of the need to hold back pressure on the control wheel, a trim tab on the elevator can be adjusted to hold the elevator in a slightly deflected position. An elevator trim tab for a Cessna 182 is shown in Figure 5-71. Anti-servo tab. Some airplanes, like a Piper Cherokee Arrow, do not have a fixed horizontal stabilizer and movable elevator. The Cherokee uses a moving horizontal surface known as a scabilator. Because of the location of the pivot point for this movable surface, it has a tendency to be extremely sensitive to pilot input. To reduce the sensitivity, a full-length anti-servo tab is installed on the trailing edge of the scabilator. As the trailing edge of the scabilator moves down, the anti-servo tab moves down and creates a force trying to raise the trailing edge. With this force acting against the movement of the scabilator, it reduces the sensitivity to pilot input. The anti-servo tab on a Piper Cherokee arrow is shown in Figure 5-70. Elevator Trim Tab. Figure 5-71. Elevator Trim Tab on the Cessna 182. 5-45. Balance Tab. On some airplanes. The force needed to move the flight controls can be excessive. In these cases, a balance tab can be used to generate a force that assists in the movement of the flight control. Just the opposite of empty servo tabs, balance tabs move in the opposite direction of the flight control's trailing edge, providing a force that helps the flight control move. Servo tab. On large airplanes, because the force needed to move the flight controls is beyond the capability of the pilot, hydraulic actuators are used to provide the necessary force. In the event of a hydraulic system malfunction or failure, some of these airplanes have servo tabs on the trailing edge of the primary flight controls. When the control wheel is pulled back in an attempt to move the elevator, the servo tab moves and creates enough aerodynamic force to move the elevator. The servo tab is acting like a balance tab, but rather than assisting the normal force that moves the elevator, it becomes the sole force that makes the elevator move. Like the balance tab, 
The servo tab moves in the opposite direction of the flight control's trailing edge. The Boeing 727 has servo tabs that back up the hydraulic system in the event of a failure. During normal flight, the servo tabs act like balance tabs. Figure 5-72. Supplemental Lift Modifying Devices. If the wing of an airplane was designed to produce the maximum lift possible at low airspeed, to accommodate takeoffs and landings, it would not be suited for higher speed flight because of the enormous amount of drag it would produce. To give the wing the ability to produce maximum low speed lift without being drag prohibitive, retractable high lift devices, such as flaps and slats, are utilized. Flaps. The most often used lift modifying device, for small airplanes and large, is the wing flap. Flaps can be installed on the leading edge or trailing edge, with the leading edge versions used only on larger airplanes. Flaps change the camber of the wing, and they increase both the lift and the drag for any given angle of attack. The four different types of flaps in use are called the plane, split, slotted, and fowler. Figure 5-73, plane flaps attach to the trailing edge of the wing, inboard of the ailerons, and form part of the wing's overall surface. When deployed downward, they increase the effective camber of the wing and the wing's cord line. Both of these factors cause the wing to create more lift and more drag. Inboard aileron tab inboard aileron. Stabilizer elevator elevator tab upper rudder anti balance tabs. Lower rudder ground spoilers inboard flap flight spoilers outboard flap balance tab outboard aileron. Leading edge flaps extended. Leading edge slats extended. Figure 5 72. Boeing 727 flight controls. 5 46. Plane flap. Split flap. Slotted flap. Fowler flap. Figure 5 73. Four types of wing flaps. The split flap attaches to the bottom of the wing, and deploys downward without changing the top surface of the wing. This type of flap creates more drag than the plane flap because of the increase in turbulence. The slotted flap is similar to the plane flap, except when it deploys, the leading edge drops down a small amount. By having the leading edge drop down slightly, a slot opens, which lets some of the high pressure air on the bottom of the wing flow over the top of the flap. This additional air flow over the top of the flap produces additional lift. The Fowler flap attaches to the back of the wing using a track and roller system. When it deploys, it moves aft in addition to deflecting downward. This increases the total wing area, in addition to increasing the wing camber and cord line. This type of flap is the most effective of the four types, and it is the type used on commercial airliners and business jets. Leading edge slots. Leading edge slots are ducts or passages in the leading edge of a wing that allow high pressure air from the bottom of the wing to flow to the top of the wing. This ducted air flows over the top of the wing at a high velocity, and helps keep the boundary layer air from becoming turbulent and separating from the wing. Slots are often placed on the part of the wing, the head of the ailerons, so during a wing stall. The inboard part of the wing stalls first, and the ailerons remain effective. Leading edge slats. Leading edge slats serve the same purpose as slots. The difference being that slats are movable, and can be retracted when not needed. On some airplanes, leading edge slats have been automatic in operation deploying in response to the aerodynamic forces that come into play during a high angle of attack. On most of today's commercial airliners, the leading edge slats deploy when the trailing edge flaps are lowered. The flight controls of a large commercial airliner are shown in figure 5-72. The controls by color are as follows. 1. All aerodynamic tabs are shown in green. 2. All leading and trailing edge high lift devices are shown in red. Leading edge flaps and slats, trailing edge inboard and outboard flaps. 3. The tail-mounted primary flight controls are in orange, rider and elevator. 4. The wing-mounted primary flight controls are in purple, inboard and outboard aileron. High-speed aerodynamics. Compressibility effects. When air is flowing at subsonic speed, it acts like an incompressible fluid. As discussed earlier in this chapter, when air at subsonic speed flows through a diverging-shaped passage, the velocity decreases and the static pressure rises, but the density of the air does not change. In a converging shaped passage, subsonic air speeds up and its static pressure decreases. When supersonic air flows through a converging passage, its velocity decreases and its pressure and density both increase. Figure 5-74. At supersonic flow, air acts like a compressible fluid. Because air behaves differently when flowing at supersonic velocity, airplanes that fly supersonic must have wings with a different shape. Supersonic. Air tilde out. Converging. Decreasing velocity increasing pressure increasing density. Diverging. Increasing velocity decreasing pressure decreasing density. Figure 5-74. Supersonic airflow through a Venturi. 5-47. The speed of sound. Sound. 
in reference to airplanes, and their movement through the air, is nothing more than pressure disturbances in the air. As discussed earlier in this chapter, it is like dropping a rock in the water, and watching the waves flow out from the center. As an airplane flies through the air, every point on the airplane that causes a disturbance creates sound energy in the form of pressure waves. These pressure waves flow away from the airplane at the speed of sound, which at standard day temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit is 761 miles per hour. The speed of sound in air changes with temperature, increasing as temperature increases. Figure 5-75 shows how the speed of sound changes with altitude. Subsonic, transonic, and supersonic flight. When an airplane is flying at subsonic speed, all of the air flowing around the airplane is at a velocity of less than the speed of sound, which is known as Mach 1. Keep in mind that the air accelerates when it flows over certain parts of the airplane, like the top of the wing. So an airplane flying at 500 miles per hour could have air over the top of the wing reach a speed of 600 miles per hour. How fast an airplane can fly and still be considered in subsonic flight varies with the design of the wing. But as a Mach number, it will typically be just over Mach 0.8. When an airplane is flying at transonic speed, part of the airplane is experiencing subsonic airflow and part is experiencing supersonic airflow. Over the top of the wing, probably about halfway back, the velocity of the air will reach Mach 1 and a shock wave will form. The shock wave forms 90 degrees to the airflow and is known as a normal shock wave. Stability problems can be encountered during transonic flight, because the shock wave can cause the airflow to separate from the wing. The shock wave also causes the center of lift to shift aft, causing the nose to pitch down. The speed at which the shock wave forms is known as the critical Mach number. Transonic speed is typically between Mach 0.80 and 1.20. When an airplane is flying at supersonic speed, the entire airplane is experiencing supersonic airflow. At this speed, the shock wave which formed on top of the wing during transonic flight has moved all the way aft, and has attached itself to the wing trailing edge. Supersonic speed is from Mach 1.20 to 5.0. If an airplane flies faster than Mach 5, it is said to be in hypersonic flight. Shock waves. Sound coming from an airplane is the result of the air being disturbed as the airplane moves through it, and the resulting pressure waves that radiate out from the source of the disturbance. For a slow-moving airplane, the pressure Altitude and feet speed of sound tilde mph degrees. Temperature tilde degrees Fahrenheit degrees. 0, 1000, 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, 6000, 7000, 8000, 9000, 10000, 15000, 20000, 25000, 30000, 35000, asterisk 36089. 40,000, 45,000, 50,000, 55,000, 60,000, 65,000, 70,000, 75,000, 80,000, 85,000, 90,000, 95,000, 100,000, 59 59.00, 55.43, 51.87, 48.30, 44.74, 41.17, 69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-69.70-
Figure 5-75 Altitude and temperature versus speed of sound Waves travel out ahead of the airplane, traveling at the speed of sound. When the speed of the airplane reaches the speed of sound, however, the pressure waves, or sound energy, cannot get away from the airplane. At this point the sound energy starts to pile up, initially on the top of the wing, and eventually attaching itself to the wing leading and trailing edges. This piling up of sound energy is called a shock wave. If the shock waves reach the ground, and cross the path of a person, they will be heard as a sonic boom. Figure 5-76A shows a wing in slow speed flight, with many disturbances on the wing generating sound pressure waves that are radiating. 5-48 A B Figure 5-76 Sound energy in subsonic and supersonic flight. Outward. View B is the wing of an airplane in supersonic flight, with the sound pressure waves piling up toward the wing leading edge. Normal shock wave. When an airplane is in transonic flight, the shock wave that forms on top of the wing, and eventually on the bottom of the wing, is called a normal shock wave. If the leading edge of the wing is blunted, instead of being rounded or sharp, a normal shock wave will also form in front of the wing during supersonic flight. Normal shock waves form perpendicular to the airstream. The velocity of the air behind a normal shock wave is subsonic, and the static pressure and density of the air are higher. Figure 5-77 shows a normal shock wave forming on the top of a wing. Oblique shock wave. An airplane that is designed to fly supersonic will have very sharp edged surfaces, in order to have the least amount of drag. When the airplane is in supersonic flight, the sharp leading edge and trailing edge of the wing will have shock waves attached to them. These shock waves are known as oblique shock waves. Behind an oblique shock wave the velocity of the air is lower, but still supersonic, and the static pressure and density are higher. Figure 5-78 shows an oblique shock wave on the leading and trailing edges of a supersonic airfoil. Expansion Wave Earlier in the discussion of high-speed aerodynamics, it was stated that air at supersonic speed acts like a compressible fluid. For this reason, supersonic air, when given the opportunity, wants to expand outward. When supersonic air is flowing over the top of a wing, and the wing surface turns away from the direction of flow, the air will expand and follow the new direction. An expansion wave will occur at the point where the direction of flow changes. Behind the expansion wave the velocity increases, and the static pressure and density decrease. An expansion wave is not a shock wave. Figure 5-78 shows an expansion wave on a supersonic airfoil. High-speed airfoils. Transonic flight is the most difficult flight regime for an airplane, because part of the wing is experiencing subsonic airflow and part is experiencing supersonic airflow. For a subsonic airfoil, the aerodynamic center, or the point of support, is approximately 25% of the way back from the wing leading edge. In supersonic flight, the aerodynamic center moves back to 50% of the wing's cord, causing some significant changes in the airplane's control and stability. Oblique shock. Expansion wave. Oblique shock. Air tilt out. Normal shock wave. Supersonic air subsonic air. Subsonic air. Figure 5-77. Normal shock wave. Figure 5-78. Supersonic airfoil with oblique shock waves and expansion waves. 5-49 If an airplane designed to fly subsonic, perhaps at a Mach number of 0.80, flies too fast and enters transonic flight, some noticeable changes will take place with respect to the airflow over the wing. Figure 5-79 shows six views of a wing, with each view showing the Mach number getting higher. The scenario for the six views is as follows. A. The Mach number is fairly low and the entire wing is experiencing subsonic airflow. B. The velocity has reached the critical Mach number, where the airflow over the top of the wing is reaching Mach 1 velocity. C. The velocity has surpassed the critical Mach number, and a normal shock wave has formed on the top of the wing. Some airflow separation starts to occur behind the shock wave. D. The velocity has continued to increase beyond the critical Mach number, and the normal shock wave has moved far enough after that serious airflow separation is occurring. A normal shock wave is now forming on the bottom of the wing as well. Behind the normal shock waves, the velocity of the air is subsonic, and the static pressure has increased. E. The velocity has increased to the point that both shock waves on the wing, top and bottom, have moved to the back of the wing, and attached to the trailing edge. Some airflow separation is still occurring. F. The forward velocity of the airfoil is greater than Mach 1, and a new shock wave has formed just forward of the leading edge of the wing. If the wing has a sharp leading edge, the shock wave will attach itself to the sharp edge. The airfoil shown in figure 5-79 is not properly designed to handle supersonic airflow. The bow wave in front of the wing leading edge of view F would be attached to the leading edge, if the wing was a double wedge or biconvex design. 
These two wing designs are shown in figure 5-80. Aerodynamic heating. One of the problems with airplanes and high-speed flight is the heat that builds up on the airplane's surface because of air friction. When the Senior 71 Blackbird airplane is cruising at Mach 3.5, skin temperatures on its surface range from 450 degrees Fahrenheit to over 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. To withstand this high temperature, the airplane was constructed of titanium alloy, instead of the traditional aluminum alloy. The supersonic transport Concorde was originally designed to cruise at Mach 2.2, but its cruise speed was reduced to Mach 2.0 because of structural problems that started to occur because of aerodynamic heating. If airplanes capable of hypersonic flight are going to be built in the future, one of the obstacles. Airflow over the entire wing is subsonic. Mach number equals 0.60. View A. Airflow over the wing reaches Mach 0.99. Supersonic flow. Mach number equals 0.82. Critical Mach number, view B. Normal shock. Subsonic. Mach number equals 0.85. View C. Supersonic flow. Normal shock. Separation. Normal shock. Mach number equals 0.88. View D. Supersonic flow. Normal shock. Mach number equals 0.95. View E. Normal shock. Bow wave. Supersonic flow. Mach number equals 1.05. View F. Figure 5-79. Airflow with progressively greater Mach numbers. 5-50. Oblique shock. Expansion wave. Oblique shock. Air tilt out. Double wedge. Oblique shock. Oblique shock. Expansion wave. Biconvex. Figure 5-80. Double wedge and biconvex supersonic wing design. That will have to be overcome as the stress on the airplane's structure caused by heat. Helicopter aerodynamics. The helicopter, as we know it today, falls under the classification known as rotorcraft. Rotorcraft is also known as rotary wing aircraft, because instead of their wing being fixed like it is on an airplane, the wing rotates. The rotating wing of a rotorcraft can be thought of as a lift-producing device, like the wing of an airplane, or as a thrust-producing device, like the propeller on a piston engine. Helicopter structures and airfoils. The main parts that make up a helicopter are the cabin, landing gear, tail boom, power plant, transmission, main rotor, and tail rotor. Figure 5-81. Main Rotor Systems. In the fully articulated rotor system, the blades are attached to the hub multiple times. The blades are hinged in a way that allows them to move up and down and fore and aft, and bearings provide for motion around the pitch change axis. Rotor systems using this type of arrangement typically have three or more blades. The hinge that allows the blades to move up and down is called the flap hinge, and movement around this. Tail rotor. Tail boom. Main rotor, power plant, cabin, transmission, landing gear, figure 5-81, main components of the helicopter, 5-51, hinge is called flap, the hinge that allows the blades to move for, and aft is called a drag or lag hinge, movement around this hinge is called dragging, lead slash lag, or hunting, these hinges and their associated movement are shown in figure 5-82, the main rotor head of the Eurocopter model 725 is shown in figure 5-83, with the drag hinge and pitch change rods visible. The semi-rigid rotor system is used with a two-blade main rotor. The blades are rigidly attached to the hub, with the hub and blades able to teeter like a seesaw. The teetering action allows the blades to flap, with one blade dropping down while the other blade rises. The blades are able to change pitch independently of each other. Figure 5-84 shows a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter in flight. This helicopter uses a semi-rigid rotor system, which is evident because of the way the rotor is tilted forward when the helicopter is in forward flight. With a rigid rotor system, the blades are not hinged for movement up and down, or flapping, or for movement fore and aft, or drag. The blades are able to move around the pitch change axis, with each blade being able to independently change its blade angle. The rigid rotor system uses blades that are very strong and yet flexible. They are flexible enough to bend when they need to, without the use of hinges, or a teetering rotor to compensate for the uneven lift that occurs in forward flight. The Eurocopter model 135 uses a rigid rotor system. Figure 5-85, anti-torque systems. Any time a force is applied to make an object rotate, there will be equal force acting in the opposite direction. If the helicopter's main rotor system rotates clockwise when viewed from the top, the helicopter will try to rotate. Drag hinge pitch change rod. Figure 5-83, Eurocopter 725 main rotor head. Semi-rigid main rotor. Figure 5-84. 
Belljet Ranger with semi-rigid main rotor Flap hinge Bead or lag Drag hinge pitch Axis of rotation flap Figure 5-82 Fully articulated main rotor head 5-52 Figure 5-85 Eurocopter model 135 rigid rotor system Counterclockwise Earlier in this chapter It was discovered that torque is what tries to make something rotate For this reason a helicopter uses what is called an anti-torque system to counteract the force trying to make it rotate. One method that is used on a helicopter to counteract torque is to place a spinning set of blades at the end of the tail boom. These blades are called a tail rotor or anti-torque rotor, and their purpose is to create a force, or thrust that acts in the opposite direction of the way the helicopter is trying to rotate. The tail rotor force, in pounds, multiplied by the distance from the tail rotor to the main rotor, in feet, creates a torque in pound feet that counteracts the main rotor torque. Figure 5-86 shows a three-bladed tail rotor on an Aero Spaciales 315B helicopter. This tail rotor has open-tipped blades that are variable pitch, and the helicopter's anti-torque pedals that are positioned like rudder pedals on an airplane, control the amount of thrust they create. Some potential problems with this tail rotor system are as follows. The spinning blades are deadly if someone walks into them. When the helicopter is in forward flight, and a vertical fin may be in use to counteract torque, the tail rotor robs engine power and creates drag. An alternative to the tail rotor seen in figure 5-86 is a type of anti-torque rotor known as a fenestron, or fan and tail. The sign is seen in figure 5-87. The rotating blades present less of a hazard to personnel on the ground, and they create less drag in flight, because they are enclosed in a shroud. A third method of counteracting the torque of the helicopter's main rotor is a technique called the no-tail rotor system, or noter. This system uses a high volume of air at low pressure, which comes from a fan driven by the helicopter's engine. The fan forces air into the tail boom, where a portion of it exits out of slots on the right side of the boom and, in conjunction with the main rotor downwash, creates a phenomenon called the Coanda effect. The air coming out of the slots on the right side of the boom causes a higher velocity, and therefore lower pressure, on that side of the boom. The higher pressure on the left side of the boom creates the primary force that counteracts the torque of the main rotor. The remainder of the air travels back to a controllable rotating nozzle in the helicopter's tail. The air exits the nozzle at a high velocity, and creates an additional force, or thrust, that helps counteract the torque of the main rotor. A notor system is shown in figures 5-88 and 5-89. For helicopters with two main rotors, such as the Chinook that has a main rotor at each end, no anti-torque rotor is needed. For this type of helicopter, the two main rotors turn in opposite directions, and each one cancels out the torque of the other. Figure 5-87. Fenestrin on a Eurocopter model 135. Figure 5-86. Aerospatial helicopter tail rotor. 5-53. Vertical axis. Longitudinal axis. Lateral axis. Figure 5-88. McDonnell Douglas 520 noter. Figure 5-90. Three axes of rotation for a helicopter. Low pressure side. High pressure side. Air exit slots. Rotating nozzle. Figure 5-89 Airflow for a noter Helicopter axes of flight Helicopters, like airplanes, have a vertical, lateral, and longitudinal axis that passes through the helicopter's center of gravity. Helicopters yaw around the vertical axis, pitch around the lateral axis, and rotate around the longitudinal axis. Figure 5-90 shows the three axes of a helicopter, and how they relate to the helicopter's movement. All three axes will intersect at the helicopter's center of gravity, and the helicopter pivots around this point. Notice in the figure that the vertical axis passes almost through the center of the main rotor, because the helicopter's center of gravity needs to be very close to this point. Control around the vertical axis. For a single main rotor helicopter, control around the vertical axis is handled by the anti-torque rotor, or tail rotor, or from the fan's airflow on a noter type helicopter. Like in an airplane, rotation around this axis is known as yaw. The pilot controls yaw by pushing on the anti-torque pedals located on the cockpit floor. In the same way the airplane pilot controls yaw by pushing on the rudder pedals. To make the nose of the helicopter yaw to the right, the pilot pushes on the right anti-torque pedal. When viewed from the top, if the helicopter tries to spin in a counterclockwise direction because of the torque of the main rotor, the pilot will also push on the right anti-torque pedal to counteract the main rotor torque. By using the anti-torque pedals, the pilot can intentionally make the helicopter rotate in either direction around the vertical axis. The anti-torque pedals can be seen in figure 5-91. Some helicopters have a vertical stabilizer, 
such as those shown in figures 5-90 and 5-92. In forward flight, the vertical stabilizer creates a force that helps counteract the torque of the main rotor, thereby reducing the power needed to drive the anti-torque system located at the end of the tail boom. Control around the longitudinal and lateral axes. Movement around the longitudinal and lateral axes is handled by the helicopter's main rotor. In the cockpit, there are two levers that control the main rotor, known as the collective and cyclic pitch controls. The collective pitch lever is on the side of the pilot's seat, and the cyclic pitch lever is at the front of the seat in the middle. Figure 5-91. When the collective pitch control lever is raised, the blade angle of all the rotor blades increases uniformly and they create the lift that allows the helicopter to take off vertically. The grip on the end of the collective pitch control is the throttle for the engine, which is rotated to increase engine power as the lever is raised. On many helicopters, the throttle automatically rotates and increases engine power as the collective lever is raised. The collective pitch lever may have adjustable friction built into it, so the pilot does not have to hold upward pressure on it during flight. The cyclic pitch control lever, like the yoke of an airplane, can be pulled back or pushed forward, and can be moved left and right. When the cyclic pitch lever is pushed forward, the rotor, 5-54 Cyclic Pitch Control Anti-Torque Pedals Collective Pitch Control Anti-Torque Pedals Figure 5-91 Helicopter Cockpit Controls Blades create more lift as they pass through the back half of their rotation and less lift as they pass through the front half. The difference in lift is caused by changing the blade angle, or pitch, of the rotor blades. The pitch change rods that were seen earlier, in figures 5-82 and 5-83, are controlled by the cyclic pitch lever and they are what change the pitch of the rotor blades. The increased lift in the back, either causes the main rotor to tilt forward, the nose of the helicopter to tilt downward, or both. The end result is the helicopter moves in the forward direction. If the cyclic pitch lever is pulled back, the rotor blade lift will be greater in the front and the helicopter will back up. If the cyclic pitch lever is moved to the left or the right, the helicopter will bank left or bank right. For the helicopter to back to the right, the main rotor blades must create more lift as they pass by the left side of the helicopter. Just the opposite is true, if the helicopter is banking to the left. By creating more lift in the back than in the front, and more lift on the left than on the right, the helicopter can be in forward flight and banking to the right. In figure 5-92, an Augusta A109 can be seen in forward flight and banking to the right. The rotor blade in the rear and the one on the left are both in an upward raised position, meaning they have both experienced the condition called flap. Some helicopters use a horizontal stabilizer, similar to what is seen on an airplane, to help provide additional stability around the lateral axis. A horizontal stabilizer can be seen on the Augusta A109 in Figure 5-92. Figure 5-92. Augusta A109 banking to the right. 5-55. Helicopters in flight. Hovering. For a helicopter, hovering means that it is in flight at a constant altitude, with no forward, aft, or sideways movement. In order to hover, a helicopter must be producing enough lift in its main rotor blades to equal the weight of the aircraft. The engine of the helicopter must be producing enough power to drive the main rotor, and also to drive whatever type of anti-torque system is being used. The ability of a helicopter to hover is affected by many things, including whether or not it is in ground effect. The density altitude of the air, the available power from the engine, and how heavily loaded it is. For a helicopter to experience ground effect, it typically needs to be no higher off the ground than one half of its main rotor system diameter. If a helicopter has a main rotor diameter of 40 foot, it will be in ground effect up to an altitude of approximately 20 foot. Being close to the ground affects the velocity of the air through the rotor blades, causing the effective angle of attack of the blades to increase and the lift to increase. So, if a helicopter is in ground effect, it can hover at a higher gross weight than it can when out of ground effect. On a windy day, the positive influence of ground effect is lessened, and at a forward speed of 5 to 10 miles per hour the positive influence becomes less. In figure 5-93, an Air Force CH-53 is seen in a hover, with all the rotor blades flapping up as a result of creating equal lift. Forward flight. In the early days of helicopter development, the ability to hover was mastered before there was success in attaining forward flight. The early attempts at forward flight resulted in the helicopter rolling over when it tried to depart from the hover and move in any direction. The cause of the rollover is what we now refer to as the symmetry of lift. When a helicopter is in a hover, all the rotor blades are experiencing the same velocity of airflow and the velocity of the airflow seen by the rotor blades changes, when the helicopter starts to move. For helicopters built in the United States, the main rotor blades turn in a counterclockwise direction when viewed from the top. Viewed from the top, as the blades move around the right side of the helicopter, they are moving toward the nose. 
As they move around the left side of the helicopter, they are moving toward the tail. When the helicopter starts moving forward, the blade on the right side is moving toward the relative wind, and the blade on the left side is moving away from the relative wind. This causes the blade on the right side to create more lift and the blade on the left side to create less lift. Figure 5-94 shows how this occurs. In Figure 5-94, blade number 2 would be called the advancing blade, and blade number 1 would be called the retreating blade. The advancing blade is moving toward the relative wind, and therefore experiences a greater velocity of airflow. The increased lift created by the blade on the right side will try to roll the helicopter to the left. If this condition is allowed to exist, it will ultimately lead to the helicopter crashing. Blade Flapping To solve the problem of dissymmetry of lift, helicopter designers came up with a hinged design that allows the rotor blade to flap up when it experiences increased lift, and to flap down when it experiences decreased lift. When a rotor blade advances toward the front of the helicopter, and experiences an increased velocity of airflow. The increase in lift causes the blade to flap up. This upward motion of the blade changes the direction of the relative wind in relation to the cord line of the blade, and causes the angle of attack to decrease. The decrease in the angle of attack decreases the lift on the blade. The retreating blade experiences a reduced velocity of airflow and reduced lift, and flaps down. By flapping down, the retreating blade ends up with an increased angle of attack and an increase in lift. The end result is the lift on the blades is equalized, and the tendency for the helicopter to roll never materializes. 1. Direction of relative wind. 2. Direction of tilde height. 100 miles per hour. Blade tip speed. 400 miles per hour. 1. Blade rotation. Blade rotation blade experiences 300 miles per hour air tilde out. Tip speed. Air speed. Blade experiences 500 miles per hour air tilde out. Tip speed plus air speed. 2. Figure 5-94. Dissymmetry of lift for rotor blades. Figure 5-93. Air Force CH-53 in a hover. 5-56. The semi-rigid and fully articulated rotor systems have flapping hinges that automatically allow the blades to move up or down with changes in lift. The rigid type of rotor system has blades that are flexible enough to bend up or down with changes in lift. Advancing blade and retreating blade problems. The blade advancing toward the relative wind sees the airflow at an ever-increasing velocity as a helicopter flies forward at higher and higher speeds. Eventually, the velocity of the air over the rotor blade will reach sonic velocity, much like the critical Mach number for the wing of an airplane. When this happens, a shock wave will form and the air will separate from the rotor blade, resulting in a high-speed stall. As the helicopter's forward speed increases, the relative wind over the retreating blade decreases, resulting in a loss of lift. The loss of lift causes the blade to flap down and the effective angle of attack to increase. At a high enough forward speed, the angle of attack will increase to a point that the rotor blade stalls. The tip of the blade stalls first, and then progresses in toward the blade root. When approximately 25% of the rotor system is stalled, due to the problems with the advancing and retreating blades, control of the helicopter will be lost. Conditions that will lead to the rotor blade stalling include high forward speed, heavy gross weight, turbulent air, high density altitude, and steep or abrupt turns. Auto rotation. The engine on a helicopter drives the main rotor system by way of a clutch and a transmission. The clutch allows the engine to be running, and the rotor system not to be turning, while the helicopter is on the ground, and it also allows the rotor system to disconnect from the engine while in flight, if the engine fails. Having the rotor system disconnect from the engine in the event of an engine failure is necessary. If the helicopter is to be capable of a flight condition called auto rotation, Auto rotation is a flight condition, where the main rotor blades are driven by the force of the relative wind passing through the blades, rather than by the engine. This flight condition is similar to an airplane gliding, if its engine fails while in flight. As long as the helicopter maintains forward airspeed, while decreasing altitude and the pilot lowers the blade angle on the blades with the collective pitch, the rotor blades will continue to rotate. The altitude of the helicopter, which equals potential energy, is given up in order to have enough energy, which will then be kinetic energy to keep the rotor blades turning. As the helicopter nears the ground, the cyclic pitch control is used to slow the forward speed, and to flare the helicopter for landing. With the airspeed bled off, and the helicopter. Normal forward tilde height under power. Direction of air tilde out. Forward tilde height in auto rotation. Direction of air tilde out. Figure 5-95. Rotor blade air flow during normal flight, and during auto rotation. Now close to the ground. The final step is to use the collective pitch control to cushion the landing. The airflow through the rotor blades in normal forward flight and in an auto rotation flight condition are shown in figure 5-95. In figure 5-96, a Bell Jet Ranger is shown approaching the ground in the final stage of an auto rotation. 
Figure 5-96 Bell Jet Ranger in final stage of auto rotation 5-57 Weight Shift Control Flexible Wing Aircraft Aerodynamics Weight Shift Control Flexible Wing Type Aircraft consists of a fabric covered wing often referred to as the sail attached to a tubular structure that has wheels seats and an engine and propeller the wing structure is also tubular with the fabric covering creating the airfoil shape the shape of the wing varies among the different models of weight shift control aircraft being produced but a delta shaped wing is a very popular design within the weight shift control aircraft community these aircraft are typically referred to as trikes figure 5-97 in figure 5-97 the trike's mast is attached to the wing at the hang point on the keel of the wing with a hang point bolt and safety cable. There is also a support tube, known as a king post, extending up from the top of the wing, with cables running down and secured to the tubular wing structure. The cables running down from the king post as part of the upper rigging are there to support the wing when the aircraft is on the ground, and to handle negative loads when in flight. The lines that run from the king post to the trailing edge of the wing are known as reflex cables. These cables maintain the shape of the wing when it is in a stalled state by holding the trailing edge of the wing up which helps raise the nose during recovery from the stall. If the aircraft goes into an inadvertent stall, having the trailing edge of the wing in a slightly raised position helps raise the nose of the aircraft and get it out of the dive. The passenger seat is centered under the wing's aerodynamic center, with the weight of the pilot being forward of this point and the weight of the engine and propeller being aft. Unlike a traditional airplane, the trike does not have a rudder, elevator, or ailerons. Instead, it has a wing that can be pivoted forward or aft, and left or right. In figure 5-98, the pilot's hand is on a control bar that is connected to a pivot point just forward of where the wing attaches. There are cables attached to the ends of the bar that extend up to the wings leading and trailing. Figure 5-97, weight shift control aircraft in level flight, edge, and to the left and right side of the crossbar. Running from the wing leading edge to trailing edge are support pieces known as battens. The battens fit into pockets and they give the wing its cambered shape. The names of some of the primary parts of the trike are shown in figure 5-98, and these parts will be referred to when the flight characteristics of the trike are described in the paragraphs that follow. In order to fly the trike, engine power is applied to get the aircraft moving. As the ground speed of the aircraft reaches a point where flight is possible, the pilot pushes forward on the control bar, which causes the wing to pivot where it attaches to the mast, and the leading edge of the wing tilts up. When the leading edge of the wing tilts up, the angle of attack and the lift of the wing increase. With sufficient lift, the trike rotates and starts climbing. Pulling back on the bar reduces the angle of attack and allows the aircraft to stop climbing and to fly straight and level. Once the trike is in level flight, airspeed can be increased or decreased by adding engine power or taking away engine power by use of the throttle. Stability in flight along the longitudinal axis, which is a nose-to-tail measurement for a typical airplane is achieved by having the horizontal stabilizer and elevator generate a force that balances out the airplane's nose-heavy tendency. It must create stability along the longitudinal axis in a different way, because the trike does not have a horizontal stabilizer or elevator. The trike has a swept-back delta wing, with the trailing edge of the wingtips located well aft of the aircraft's center of gravity. Pressure acting on the tips of the delta wing creates the force that balances out the nose-heavy tendency. The wings of weight shift control aircraft are designed in a way that allows them to change their shape when subjected to an external force. This is possible because the frame leading edges and the sail are flexible, which is why they are sometimes referred to as flexible wing aircraft. This produces somewhat different aerodynamic effects when compared with a normal fixed wing aircraft. A traditional small airplane, like a Cessna 172, turns or banks by using the ailerons, effectively altering the camber of the wing, and thereby generating differential lift. By comparison, Weight shift on a trike actually causes the wing to twist, which changes the angle of attack on the wing, and causes the differential lift to exist that banks the trike. The crossbar, or wing spreader, of the wing frame is allowed to float slightly with respect to the keel, and this, along with some other geometric considerations allows the sail to billow shift. Billow shift can be demonstrated on the ground by grabbing the trailing edge of one end of the wing and lifting up on it. If this was done, the fabric on the other end of the wing would become slightly flatter and tighter, and the wing's angle of attack would increase. 5-58 Wing Batten Cross Bar Wing Keel Mast Wing Attach Point Nose Strut Control Bar with Cables Attached to the Wing Throttle Brakes Figure 5-98 Weight Shift Control Aircraft Getting Ready for Flight If the pilot pushes the bar to the right, the wing pivots with the left wingtip dropping down and the right wingtip rising up, causing the aircraft to back to the left. 
This motion is depicted in figure 5-99, showing a hang glider as an example. The shift in weight to the left increases the wing loading on the left, and lessens it on the right. The increased loading on the left wing increases its washout, and reduces its angle of attack and lift. The increased load on the left wing causes the left wing to billow, which causes the fabric to tighten on the right wing and the angle of attack and lift to increase. The change in lift is what banks the aircraft to the left. Billow on the left wing is depicted in figure 5-100. Shifting weight to the right causes the aircraft to bank right. The weight of the trike and its occupants acts like a pendulum, and helps keep the aircraft stable in flight. Pushing or pulling on the bar, while in flight causes the weight hanging below the wing to shift its position relative to the wing, which is why the trike is referred to as a weight shift aircraft. Direction of turn. Aircraft banks to the left because of increased lift on the right wing. Billow. A. R. C. R. A. Foot rolls. T. O. Left. Weight shifted to left. Pushing the bar to the right shifts the weight to the left. Push out. Figure 5-100. Weight shift to the left causing a left hand turn. Figure 5-99. Direction of turn based on weight shift. 5-59. Once the trike is in flight, and flying straight and level, the pilot only needs to keep light pressure on the bar that controls the wing. If the trike is properly balanced and there is no air turbulence, the aircraft will remain stable even if the pilot's hands are removed from the bar. The same as with any airplane, increasing engine power will make the aircraft climb and decreasing power will make it descend. The throttle is typically controlled with a foot pedal. Like a gas pedal in an automobile, a trike lands in a manner very similar to an airplane. When it is time to land, the pilot reduces engine power with a foot-operated throttle, causing airspeed and wing lift to decrease. As the trike descends, the rate of descent can be controlled by pushing forward or pulling back on the bar, and varying engine power. When the trike is almost to the point of touchdown, the engine power will be reduced and the angle of attack of the wing will be increased, to cushion the descent, and provide a smooth landing. If the aircraft is trying to land in a very strong crosswind, the landing may not be so smooth. When landing in a crosswind, the pilot will land in a crab to maintain direction down the runway. Touchdown is done with the back wheels first, then letting the front wheel down. A trike getting ready to touch down can be seen in figure 5-101. The control cables coming off the control bar can be seen, and the support mast and the cables on top of the wing, including the luff lines, can also be seen. Powered Parachute Aerodynamics A powered parachute has a carriage very similar to the weight shift control aircraft. Its wing, however, has no support structure or rigidity, and only takes on the shape of an airfoil when it is inflated by the blast of air from the propeller, and the forward speed of the aircraft. In Figure 5-102, a powered parachute is on its approach to land with the wing fully inflated and rising up above the aircraft. Each colored section of the inflated wing is made up of cells that are open in. Figure 5-102, powered parachute with the wing inflated, the front to allow air to ram in, and closed in the back to keep the air trapped inside. In between all the cells there are holes that allow the air to flow from one cell to the next. In order to equalize the pressure within the inflated wing, the wing is attached to the carriage of the aircraft by a large number of nylon, or Kevlar lines that run from the tips of the wing all the way to the center. The weight of the aircraft acting on these lines, and their individual lengths cause the inflated wing to take its shape. The lines attach to the body of the aircraft at a location very close to where the center of gravity is located and this attachment point is adjustable to account for balance changes with occupants of varying weights. As in weight shift control aircraft, the powered parachute does not have the traditional flight controls of a fixed wing airplane. When the wing of the aircraft is inflated and the aircraft starts moving forward, the wing starts generating lift. Once the ground speed is sufficient for the wing's lift greater than the weight of the aircraft, the aircraft lifts off the ground. Unlike an airplane, where the pilot has a lot of control over when the airplane rotates by deciding when to pull back on the yoke, the powered parachute will not take off until it reaches a specific airspeed. The powered parachute will typically lift off the ground at a speed somewhere between 28 and 30 miles per hour, and will have airspeed in flight of approximately 30 miles per hour. Once the powered parachute is in flight, control over climbing and descending is handled with engine power. Advancing the throttle makes the aircraft climb, and retarding the throttle makes it descend. The inflated wing creates a lot of drag in flight, so reducing the engine power creates a very controllable descent of the aircraft. The throttle, for controlling engine power, is typically located on the right-hand side of the pilot. Figure 5-103, Figure 5-101, Weight Shift Control Aircraft Landing, 5-60, Figure 5-103, Two-Seat Powered Parachute, 
Turning of the powered parachute in flight is handled by foot-operated pedals, or steering bars, located at the front of the aircraft. These bars can be seen in figure 5-103. Each foot-operated pedal controls a set of lines, usually made from nylon that runs up to the trailing edge of each wingtip. When the right foot pedal is pushed, the line pulls down on the tailing edge of the eight wingtip. As the trailing edge of the right wing drop downs, drag is increased on the right side and the aircraft turns right. When pressure is taken off the foot pedal, the drag in the entire airfoil equalizes and the aircraft resumes its straight and level flight. To land a powered parachute, the first action the pilot takes is to reduce engine power and allow the aircraft to descend. With the power reduced to idle, the aircraft will descend at a rate of approximately 5 to 10 FPS. As the aircraft approaches the ground, the descent rate can be lessened by increasing the engine power. Just before touchdown, the pilot pushes on both foot-operated pedals to drop the trailing edges on both sides of the wing. This action increases the drag on the wing uniformly, causing the wing to pivot aft, which raises the wing leading edge and increases the angle of attack and lift. In figure 5-104, the pilot is pushing on both foot pedals and the left and right wing trailing edges are deflected downward. The aircraft has just touched down and the wing is trailing behind the aircraft, caused by the high angle of attack. And the additional drag on the wing. The increase in lift reduces the descent rate to almost nothing, and provides for a gentle landing. If the pilot pushes on the foot pedals too soon, the wing may pivot too far aft before touchdown resulting in an unacceptable descent rate. In that case, it might be relatively hard landing. Figure 5-104 Powered Parachute Wing Trailing Edge 5-61 5-62 Chapter 6 Aircraft Weight and Balance 